Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And look, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So the eunuch asked Philip, of whom does this prophet say this, himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is some water. What prevents me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your presence here with us today. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your powerful word. Pray, Lord, that you'd come now and breathe life among us. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if you have ever been to the ends of the earth. A few years ago, a group of us from Harvest Time went to Kenya to conduct a gospel crusade among the Maasai people. It was an open air valley uh, meeting in the Rift Valley. And because there were no accommodations, we would drive by bus back and forth from Nairobi every day. We spent a couple hours on the highway going down into the Rift Valley. And then we turned on to a secondary road that led to the village of Suswa. And then at Suswa, we got on a dirt road. At least they said there was a road. I couldn't see any road. It looked like we were just going right across the floor of the desert. And as we were bumping along, we began to see the Maasai people, magnificent, regal, wearing bright red robes and their beautiful dark skin and their tall postures and their long walking sticks. You know, I don't think we were at the end of the earth, but I'm pretty sure that you could see it from there. And as I was just basking in this exotic once-in-a-lifetime experience, I saw this sight that ruined everything. I saw a Maasai warrior walking along, talking on his cell phone. <laughs> I'm, what? Put that away. You're ruining my moment. Uh, we've come all the way from America to the ends of the earth to save you. Put that cell phone away and walk. I found out that on the Rift Valley, the cell signal travels for hundreds of miles because there's nothing to obstruct it. And in the little village of Suswa, where we turned off onto the dirt road, there was an internet cafe. It was a cinder block building with an aluminum roof where the Maasai would charge up their cell phones before they headed out into the wilderness. Philip was on the road to the ends of the earth. God sent him in pursuit of an Ethiopian official. 
In Philip's day, the Ethiopians were considered to live at the ends of the earth. And before this man headed off into the wilderness, God wanted to fill him up. So he sent Philip, who was filled up with the Holy Spirit. That's how Philip is introduced to us in Acts chapter 6. The Bible calls him a man full of the Holy Spirit, a good witness and full of the wisdom that comes by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 8, we read about his life. And as I look at Philip, I find three reasons to fill up with the Holy Spirit. And I want to share them with you quickly today. And of course, by quickly, I mean Hey, the pregame doesn't start till 5.30, so sit back, relax for a little while. Let's talk about three reasons to fill up with the Holy Spirit. First of all, fill up with the Holy Spirit so that you can receive God's guidance. Fill up with the Holy Spirit so that you can receive God's guidance. One thing that stands out immediately to me in this story is how God guides his own. You know, of all God's promises to us, I think one of the most precious ones to me is the promise of his guidance in life. And you shall hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. As I look at Philip, one thing I see is that the Holy Spirit guides us through a variety of means. One way that he guides us is through difficulties through hardships, through unpleasant circumstances. You know, I wish it wasn't so, but it is true. Here, Philip was enjoying a fruitful ministry in Jerusalem. He was one of the seven Greek-speaking believers who was appointed to be a pastor over the Greek-speaking congregation and to care for the widows. Everything was going swimmingly for Philip, and all of a sudden, trouble arises. Stephen is martyred, and great persecution breaks out against the church. But listen, the Holy Spirit used those troubles to catapult Stephen forward into God's purposes for his life. Because of those troubles, overnight, Philip went from being a busboy to being Billy Graham. Beloved, I want to tell you that when you're filled up with the Holy Spirit, troubles do not break you, they make you. Not everything is heaven sent, but everything is heaven used for our good and for God's glory in our lives. Jesus said in this life, you will have trouble. Things change. People change. They change in their disposition towards us. Economies change. Can I get an amen? Amen. Governments and societies change. Ours is changing right now. Circumstances change. Our health changes. And sometimes with those changes come trouble. But when, I, when you're filled up with the Holy Spirit, those troubles become God's opportunities to push you forward in His purposes for your life. Beloved, can I give you a word of encouragement this morning? If you're struggling with some problems right now, could it be that God wants to push you to a higher purpose? If things aren't working out so well, if you're having trouble making ends meet, if you're not being effective or fruitful where you are, if there's a lot of conflict and turmoil around you, if people aren't receiving you, could it be that the Holy Spirit is trying to push you to make some changes in your life? The Holy Spirit guides through difficulties. Another way that he guides us is through supernatural encounters. The Ethiopian story begins with an angel giving marching orders to Philip. I've seen angels twice in my life. Both times they intervened in moments that I was in trouble. One time my father-in-law was with me. But I've never received a word of guidance from an angel at least not yet, but God still does guide his people that way, and I'm ready. One thing we know is that no angel sent from God 
will ever add anything to Scripture or tell us something that is contradictory to the Word of God or direct us in a way that's contrary to His Word. But God does use these kind of supernatural encounters. The Holy Spirit guides us through dreams. He guides us through visions. He guides us through prophecies. He guides us through the revelation that follows speaking in other tongues. For that, we must be filled up with the Holy Spirit. At the end of this story, the Holy Spirit guided Philip through one of the most unusual miracles in the book of Acts. Philip was supernaturally picked up from the city of Gaza and moved to the city of Azotus. He got a, an airlift 20 miles away. From there, Philip evangelized the entire coast of Israel. Jesus had this experience of supernatural translation, as well as the Apostle Paul and Elijah. Growing up, we had a missionary in our church from India, and she shared of an occasion one night where the Lord translated her and three other missionaries in a car. They had been doing a gospel meeting in a Hindu village, and everyone in the village had accepted Christ except for the witch doctor and the chief of the village. And they started out at night uh, to make their way back to the city on the one road that led there. And she said that they blinked their eyes, and the next thing they knew, they were just leaving the village, and the next thing they knew, they were entering the city limits of that city that was several miles away. Later on, they learned that an ambush had been set for them along the road and that radical Hindus who were upset because of the evangelizing that they were doing in that entire region were laying in wait to kill them. And when they realized that somehow they had made it from the village to the city without ever passing by them, they repented and they asked Jesus Christ into their hearts. The Holy Spirit guides through supernatural encounters. Another way that the Holy Spirit guides is by his voice within us. At the direction of the angel, Philip began traveling down the desert road to Gaza. And when he saw the Ethiopian official in his chariot, the Holy Spirit spoke to him within and said, go catch up to that chariot and run alongside it. Learning to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit within us is something that grows over time. But I love what our friend Pastor Jackson Sinyanga says. One way to know if it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you is if what you heard makes you go, say what? <laughs> I have on my computer monitor in my desk in my office, I, I have taped up on the corner a little sign that says, say what? To remind me that God's ideas are great big ideas. If you want to learn how to discern the inner voice of the Holy Spirit, the place to begin is by being filled up with Him. Philip shows us that the Holy Spirit guides us through a variety of means and that the Holy Spirit, listen, this is good, guides us in the will of God from general to specific. The Holy Spirit guides us in the will of God from the general to the specific. So many believers wish that they could receive more guidance from the Lord. How many of you just wish you could receive more guidance, that, that the Lord would speak to you more clearly about the decisions that you have to make? You know, I don't want to make any more bad decisions in my life. They're too painful. They're, they're too damaging. They're, they're too difficult to rebound from. Uh, if only an angel would speak to me, if only I would hear his voice just so clearly as Philip did. What we forget is that there is a necessary progression in the will of God from the general to the specific. Beloved, listen to me. Before Philip ever saw an angel, before he was ever supernaturally airlifted to another city, he was obedient to the will of God revealed in the word of God. He distributed aid to the widows in Jerusalem because the word says so. He preached the gospel in Samaria because Jesus' last word was be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
as Philip was obedient to the general will of God revealed in the word of God, the Holy Spirit began to guide him more specifically. You know, Solomon wrote that principle down a thousand years earlier. You already know it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. The word is footpaths in Hebrew. In all your footpaths, acknowledge him and he will direct your highways. That's the way that verse really reads. Acknowledge him in the daily routines of your life and he shall direct your major decisions. So many believers are praying, God, I want to know your will. I want to know your will. Lord, please show me your will. Beloved, can I tell you his will is already written right here. And if we would implement his written will in our daily routines, then we would begin hearing more specifically for our decisions. If you want more guidance, follow the guidance he's already given you. The Holy Spirit guides through a variety of means. He guides us from general to specific and closely related. The Holy Spirit guides us commensurate with our obedience. The Holy Spirit guides us commensurate with our obedience. Listen to me and may God give you grace. The more we obey, the more God guides. The less we obey, the less God guides. Because Philip obeyed the general words of Jesus, God spoke to him specifically by an angel. And what the angel told him to do was counterintuitive in every way. You remember, Philip was leading a burgeoning revival in Samaria. And God directs him to leave and to go down the desert road to Gaza. Beloved, Gaza was a ghost town. It had been destroyed in a war and the Romans rebuilt the city in another location. But the Holy Spirit directs him to go there and he directs him to go down a road that was remote and rarely traveled. You want to talk about the road less traveled by. Philip is actually elated when he sees someone else on the road. Oh look, thank God there's someone else out here. And God told him to go at high noon. That word translated south in your English Bible is the word high noon. Beloved, have you ever gone to the desert in high noon? Even the cacti are looking for shade. Okay, God, now let me get this straight. You want me to leave this burgeoning revival in Samaria. You want me to travel down the desert road to a ghost town at high noon. God, nothing moves in the desert at high noon. Nothing except an Ethiopian and God's messenger. But Philip obeyed immediately. He rose up. He hopped to it. And because he obeyed, he kept receiving more and more guidance. Beloved, I want to tell you, that's the way that it works in our lives too. We so desperately want the Holy Spirit guides, but he only guides us commensurate with our obedience. I travel a lot of miles doing my job to a lot of different places. I go to people's homes, I go to funeral homes, cemeteries, wedding halls, meeting places, you name it. A lot of times I'm finding my way places I've never been before. Back in the old days, I had MapQuest. Jesus, thank you that you delivered me from MapQuest. I can't tell you how many times that MapQuest has left me stranded and not knowing where I am. And then I got a Garmin, and the, the Garmin was a little better but it wasn't foolproof. Now I have a minivan. Woohoo! <laughs> and my minivan has a GPS on board. And it gives me real time information while I'm traveling. It tells me if there's construction ahead. It tells me if there's slow or stop traffic ahead. It offers me alternate routes. It's pretty cool. But there's one thing I notice about my onboard GPS. If I disobey her, she gives me the silent treatment. <laughs> the, the screen keeps directing me along a route, but she stops giving me verbal commands. 
She stops giving me the real-time updates. She stops displaying the time to my destination. It's as if she is dismayed by my disobedience. I actually have to pull over on the side of the road and put my car in park, and I have to re-enter the destination in order for her to begin speaking to me again. <laughs> Beloved, I want to tell you that our disobedience dismays the Holy Spirit too. When we disobey him, listen, I'm not talking about a slip and fall. I'm not talking about an occasion where the enemy just uh, catches, uh, catches us off guard and, and we fall into a, a sin. I'm talking about when we're living a life of disobedience. When we're living in disobedience, his voice grows quiet. We stop receiving real-time updates from him. Until we stop and we repent and we recommit to following his every command again. But I want to tell you, thank God, no matter how far off the course we may wander, when we pull over and when we reset with him, God finds us exactly where we are and he leads us home again. Sometimes God guides us to destinations that are counterintuitive. Sometimes he calls us to leave a boom town and go to a ghost town. Sometimes he guides us along routes that are counterintuitive. Sometimes he calls us into the desert. Sometimes he calls us on lonely paths, on roads less traveled by. Lord, are you sure this is the right way? Because this sure doesn't feel like the way to the top to me. Sometimes he guides us to move at times that are counterintuitive. God, I can't go now. I have too many responsibilities. God, I'm too young. God, I'm too old. God, my kids are too small. God, my bills are too big. God, the economy is terrible. This is not a good time to make a move like that. Don't you know that? But if we only follow his living voice, God will lead us to the right place at the right time, every time. And beloved, let me give you this word of encouragement. This is for someone here this morning. God will never, ever leave you stranded in the desert. The Sinai wilderness means prickly. It's uncomfortable. It's inhospitable. And it may be that God has led you for a season through a prickly place. But I want to tell you, I want to give you a word of encouragement. He will not leave you stranded here. This is not the way your story ends. This is not where and how you finish in God's perfect timing. He makes everything beautiful in his time. In God's perfect timing, he will bear you up out of this desert on eagle's wings. Fill up with the Holy Spirit so that you can receive his guidance. Three reasons to fill up with the Holy Spirit. Second reason is this. Fill up with the Holy Spirit so that you can serve anyone, anywhere, at any time. Fill up with the Holy Spirit so that you can serve anyone, anywhere, at any time. Philip was filled up with the Holy Spirit. And because he was, he was able to serve a variety of people in a variety of settings. The Holy Spirit pours love into our hearts for people from all walks of life. Beloved, I want to tell you, God hasn't called us to serve just one kind of people. God has served us, called us to serve all people, and he gives us the supernatural ability to connect with all of them, no matter how different from us they may be or how distant from us they may be. <clears throat> Paul said, God has lavishly poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. The Holy Spirit pours love for God into our hearts. The Holy Spirit enables us to receive God's love. He helps us to feel loved by God. And the Holy Spirit helps us to love others like God. He gives us God's love for other believers. He gives us God's love for others who are very different from us. He gives us God's love for unbelievers. He gives us God's love even for those that we dislike or we consider enemies. 
Philip was a single young man in Acts 8. Later on, 20 years later, Paul meets him in Caesarea, and he's married then, and he has four young daughters. But here he's a single young man. And as a single young man, God put a love in his heart for the widows of Jerusalem. He served the older women. He cared for the older women. He fed them. He pastored them. You know, I've seen this phenomenon over and over again in the body of Christ. God, God brings believers together from totally different backgrounds, from do totally different walks of life and experiences from different generations, and he brings them together in a bond of love and a bond of relationship that otherwise could not exist. I remember when the Greenwich outpouring first started early last summer, and I would go home night after night around midnight, and I'd go online. And there online were all kinds of people who had just come home from the meeting, teenagers and young adults and middle-aged people and seniors all together just basking in the glory of what God had done in our midst, connected by the Holy Spirit. Only God can do that. Philip not only served the widows, he served the Samaritans, the sworn enemies of the Jews. I want you to do something with me for just a minute this morning. Would you close your eyes for just one moment, everybody? Close your eyes, and I want you to just think about the group of people whom you like the least. Who is it? Who troubles you? Who threatens you? Who angers you? About whom can you find nothing good to say? Who deserves to go to hell in your estimation? Is it a particular ethnic group? Is it a particular race? Is it Democrats? Is it social liberals? Maybe it's Republicans. Maybe it's social conservatives. Is it another religious group? Is it a group of hell raisers? Have you got the picture in your mind? Who is it whom you like least? Now while your eyes are closed, I want you to imagine yourself going to wherever it is that they meet. Imagine going to their home. Imagine going to their turf and offering to serve them. That's exactly what Philip did. You may open your eyes. A few years ago, Denise's home church in Toronto bought a strip club that was located directly across the street from the church. And they converted it into a food bank and into a Christian help center, counseling center. They run 12-step groups for people to get out of addiction, to receive counseling. Right next to the food bank is the Hells Angels Clubhouse. They were very enthusiastic patrons of the previous establishment. And they weren't particularly happy when it came under new ownership. As you can imagine, there was a lot of action between those two properties on the weekends, and the church people hated it, bothered them. Uh, they resented it, made them feel fearful. They used to stand and, and stretch their hands across the street and bind the spirits of darkness from inside the church walls. <laughs> they used to go Jericho march to two properties on Sunday mornings when everybody was sleeping it off. There had been some bad uh, exchanges between the former pastor of the church and the Hells Angels. And then one day, Denise's pastor ordered a big spread for lunch, and he had it delivered to the Hells Angels clubhouse. And then he went over and he knocked on the door, and he introduced himself. And he said, I'm Pastor Billy. I'm just wondering if there's anybody that would like prayer today. And several of them asked him to pray for some different things. They were so taken aback that they invited him back again and again and again. And now they have once a week a standing lunch together with the pastor at the Hells Angels Clubhouse. <laughs> Several of them have started attending worship and a bunch of them have given their hearts to Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit Help Pastor Billy to serve people who were very different and very distant from him. 
By the way, my wife's parents run that food bank, and over the last couple of years, they have had the opportunity to lead dozens and dozens and dozens of Muslim and Hindu families to faith in Jesus Christ. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who hate you. Philip served the widows. He served the Samaritans. And he served the Ethiopian official. Here was a man from a different race, from a different country, and from a different social class. The royal treasurer of Candace, queen of Ethiopia. This was a black man who was way out of Philip's league. He was wealthy. He was educated. He was powerful. He was important. Philip had no right to even go up and address that official. But he gained entrance into the man's heart by offering to serve him. Beloved, can I tell you, even right here in Tony Greenwich, Connecticut, even right here in wealthy Westchester, even right here in fabulous Fairfield County, there is no one so wealthy, so powerful, so important that it's beyond the ability of the Holy Spirit to connect us with them if not as an equal, at least through an offer to serve. The Holy Spirit pours love in our heart for people from all walks of life, down and outers and up and comers and everything in between her. Just let that love pour in. The Holy Spirit dispatches us to catch people before it's too late. I wonder if the Ethiopian official was feeling buyer's remorse about his journey to Jerusalem. Ethiopia was a thousand miles away. That was a five-month journey by wagon each way. This was a -a once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. Only the Ethiopian was a eunuch. Like so many royal officials in that part of the world, he was castrated, which means that he couldn't enter the temple beyond the court of the Gentiles. He couldn't pass through the beautiful gate where the crippled man had once been healed. He was a God-fearing Gentile, but he could never become a full-fledged proselyte of Judaism because he was a eunuch. It seems that he left Jerusalem with as many spiritual questions as he had come with. He did manage to acquire a copy of the scroll of Isaiah, something that was extremely rare, extremely precious, extremely valuable, but he couldn't find anyone who would explain it to him. Had it really been worth the trip? And now he began that five-month journey home. He was on the desert road to Gaza, the last stop in Israel, and God dispatched Philip to go catch up to him before it was too late, before he crossed the border and out of reach. Beloved, listen to me, and may God give you grace. All around us every day are people who are about to slip out of reach. People who are traveling away from God. People who are about to cross the border into deep darkness. Even people who are about to cross the threshold into eternity. The Holy Spirit gave Philip eyes to see. Look, an Ethiopian, he's about to cross the border. And the Holy Spirit told him, go catch up with him before it's too late. Beloved, can I tell you, we need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit so that we can spot the ones who are on the edge. Our ears need to be tuned to the Holy Spirit so that we can move at just the right time. Imagine if Philip had waited till 3 o'clock when the sun was a little lower in the sky. Imagine if he had waited until the next morning to get a fresh start on the day. He would have never caught up with the Ethiopian in time. A while back ago, Denise's, one of Denise's relatives was in bad shape in the hospital. And one night the Lord awoke her sister-in-law, Patty. She woke up her husband, Doug, and she said, Doug, we have to go right now and pray for Margaret. 
She was in a hospital in Kitchener over an hour away, but they got up and they got dressed and they went to the hospital in the middle of the night. When they got there, they found Margaret awake and lucid for the first time in days. She was a hard woman. She had a hard life. She would never allow anybody to preach the gospel to her. But Patty got down on her knees and she told Margaret the good news about Jesus. And Margaret asked Jesus Christ into her heart. Before the sun came up, she slipped into eternity and right into the arms of Jesus. Because, Philip, because Patty was filled up with the Holy Spirit and she was listening. Those who are the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Beloved, the Holy Spirit sends us out of our way for just one soul. That's what I love about this story. It reminds us how much God cares for each one of us. Think about it. God yanked one of his very best agents out of a burgeoning revival and he sent him out into the desert just to get one man. God took the initiative. God saw the earnest spiritual hunger and desire in the Ethiopian's heart and he sent someone way out of the way just for him. Doesn't it blow you away when you remember that God sent someone way out of the way just for you? I'm here today because one awful Sunday morning in 1974, God sent my Aunt Goob out of the way to get my mom and take her to church where she received Jesus Christ in a crisis moment in her life and got filled with the Holy Spirit. Who is it that God sent for you? Who did God send into your life that, that invited you to come to church, that asked you to come to a meeting, that slipped you that book, that turned your whole world upside down, that said that one thing to you, that caused faith to come awake in your heart? Who was it that God sent after you and asked you, can I just pray with you? Would you like to study the Bible together? Doesn't it fill your heart to overflowing with joy to know that God sent someone out of their way just for you? The Holy Spirit enables us to guide people to Jesus on the spot. The Holy Spirit sent Philip down the desert road to Gaza at high noon. When he saw the Ethiopian's chariot, the Holy Spirit said, Go catch up to that chariot and run alongside of it. Beloved, catching people sometimes takes a little bit of effort. Sometimes it means we have to exert ourselves. But when Philip caught up to the chariot, he overheard the Ethiopian reading aloud from the scroll of Isaiah. He asked him, do, do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian said, how can I? There's no one to guide me. And he invited Philip up into the chariot. And he asked him a question. Who is this about? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Philip opened up his mouth. And beginning with that scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. The Isaiah passage was about Jesus. Beloved, in fact, the entire Bible is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and only about Jesus. Christianity is Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The Holy Spirit guided the mind and the mouth of Philip so that what he spoke was custom-tailored to meet the Ethiopian's needs. What Philip shared with him was not from what was stored up in his head, but from the store of the Spirit within him. And beloved, when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He enables us the same way. We don't answer people out of what's stored up in our minds, but we answer people from the store of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit makes you an on-the-spot expert in the subject of Jesus. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will take of what is mine and he'll make it known to you. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will help you to remember everything that I said to you. He, Jesus said in the clutch, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. The Holy Spirit helps us to start with people's questions and to guide them 
all the way to Jesus. Three reasons to fill up. Fill up so that you can receive guidance. Fill up so that you can serve anyone, anywhere, at any time. And finally this, fill up so that you can fill others up too. Fill up so that you can fill others up too. Philip's spirit-inspired witnessing was effective. It brought the Ethiopian to a moment of decision. As they came to the last oasis in Israel, the Ethiopian asked, Here is some water. What prevents me from being baptized? When a Gentile became a proselyte to the Jewish faith, water baptism was one of the steps. But being a eunuch, the Ethiopian had not been eligible for Jewish baptism in Jerusalem. But right where he was reading in the book of Isaiah, there's a promise about the Messiah. Let the foreigner no longer say, I am excluded from the people of God. Let the eunuch no longer complain, I am a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, I will give them a memorial within the walls of the temple. I will give them a name better than sons and daughters, a name that lasts forever. I will bring them to my holy mountain and I will give them joy in my house. He commanded the chariot to stop. He and Philip went down into the water and an Ethiopian eunuch became a full-fledged proselyte of Israel's Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. The oldest manuscripts in the book of Acts say that the Holy Spirit fell down on the eunuch and caught Philip up and carried him away. And the Ethiopian went home full of the joy of the Lord. Beloved, when we're filled up with the Holy Spirit, others who have been with us will leave filled up too. Church history records that the eunuch went home and evangelized the Ethiopian people. He took the gospel to the ends of the earth, just as Jesus had said, all because a man named Philip was filled up with the Holy Spirit. Shall we stand on our feet today and shall we ask the Holy Spirit to fill us right now? Come on, would you give a big praise to the Lord right now in this place? Come on, I know you can do better than that. Come on, would you give a big, big praise to Him? Come on, would you give a big praise to Him right now? Come on, would you just say the name of Jesus with me? Come on, would you just say the name of Jesus with me? Jesus, we love you. We worship you. Come on, lift up your voice. Amazing love. Amazing love. Beloved, would you bow your heads all over this place with me today? You know, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I know we're thinking about parties and all the things. Just before we leave this morning, I have to ask this question. Christianity is Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. The whole Bible is all about Jesus. Who is this about? He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Like a sheep is silent before his shearers, so he opened not his mouth. It's all about Jesus. It's all about our connection with him. It's all about our relationship with him. The Ethiopian eunuch came to a moment of faith, a moment that he believed, a moment that he received wonder if there's someone here in this service and you're not sure that you've ever had that moment. You're not sure if you've ever invited Jesus Christ into your heart. 
you're not sure if you've ever asked him to forgive your sins, that you've invited him to be the leader of your life. The Bible says all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. All of us have lived a life of disobedience, traveling away from God. But the Lord wants to know if today you'd like to make that moment of decision and invite Jesus into your heart. All heads are bowed all over this place. If you want to ask Jesus in, all those wonderful things, the guidance of the Lord, the love he pours in our heart, the supernatural uh, things, the experiences, they, they all begin with asking Jesus into your heart. I wonder if there's someone here and you're not sure you've ever done that. And today is your day. While heads are bowed, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in. And I want to ask you, if you want to pray that prayer with me, would you just lift your hand up high wherever you are this morning? I want to invite Jesus in. Come on, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. Come on, I want to invite, there's five, six, seven, eight. Come on, I want to invite Jesus in. Nine, ten. Come on, someone else. I want to invite Jesus into my heart. It's all about Jesus. There's another one. Come on. I lost count. I don't know whether that's 11 or 12. Come on, there's somebody else in the back. Come on, I want to invite Jesus into my heart. I want to ask Jesus in. I want to invite him in. Come on, there's two more right here. Come on, I want to invite Jesus in. Somebody else, I want to ask Jesus in. There's someone else right here in the front. Come on, I want to invite Jesus in. Come on, would you lift up everybody? Would you lift up your hands all over this place? And I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want everyone to pray with me. If you already know Jesus, I want you to be one of the four friends. We're going to carry some people to an encounter with Jesus right now. Listen to me. When we pray this prayer, something's going to happen to you. When we pray this prayer, something, you're going to feel something break inside of your life. When you pray this prayer, the life of God is going to come inside of you. It's going to start you on a journey that's going to change everything. Come on, let's all pray. You follow after me. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe. You are the Son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. I've been traveling away from you. But today I turn around. Jesus, I need your washing. I need your cleansing. Forgive my sin. Change me inside. Make me new. Jesus, from now on, I'm following you. You're every command. You're my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a big praise in this place. Thank you, Lord. 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 Listen to me. There, there is a party going on in heaven that's bigger than a Super Bowl party right now. The angels are celebrating and rejoicing because of the prayer that you just prayed. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to close this service in just one moment, and when we do, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to come forward. Our pastors are going to be here. We have something that we want to give you to take home that's going to help you get started on your new journey with Jesus Christ. Come on, would you all lift your hands up for one more moment? We're going to go in just one moment. But before we do, I want you to just ask the Lord, Father, would you fill me up again today? Fill me up with the Holy Spirit. Fill me up fresh and new with the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus said, if your fathers being sinful know how to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit every time we ask Him? Come on, just say, Father, fill me up fresh. Fill me up right now with the Holy Spirit. It's going to be a big week this week. Big opportunities are coming your way this week, and you need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit so that you're ready. A promotion's coming your way this week, and you need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit so that you're ready to seize the moment. And there's going to be a divine encounter that God has organized for you this week. And you need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. Come on, just ask Him right now. Holy Spirit, pour your love into my heart so that I might be able to serve anyone, anywhere, at any time. So that I might love people from all different walks of life, no matter how different or distant they may be from me. Come on, ask Him. Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit so I have eyes to see, Lord, the divine appointments that you've arranged this week. Give me ears to hear your voice so that I move just at the right time. Lord, fill my mouth with your Holy Spirit so that as I speak to others, Lord, I speak in a way that is custom tailored to answer their spiritual questions and to meet their spiritual needs. Fill me up. Come on, lift up your hands. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up. Fill me up with the refreshing of the Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name. Come on, give them a big praise, church. Hallelujah. I want to ask our pastors and prayer teams, would you come right now? Just come right now and come face the people. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, don't leave before you just come up quickly. Share with one of our pastors that you prayed to invite Jesus into your heart. We just want to celebrate with you and we have we have something that we want to give you just before you leave today. Take somebody's hand next to you. How many of you know it's going to be a good week this week? Amen. Who are you rooting for? Jesus. Jesus. All right. That's good. Uh, I really meant which football team are you rooting for? <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm rooting for the Ravens because, you know, the blindside guy is playing. And, you know, it'd just be a really good, like, good end to his testimony of the love of Christ. That was a Christian, Christian family that took him in. What a great, what a great uh, cherry on top to the testimony of he got a Super Bowl ring. So I don't care who you like. I, I'm rooting for Jesus, so I'm rooting for the Ravens for that reason. So come on. It's going to be a great week in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for this time in your presence as we go our own.